Welcome to today's webinar, Measuring Nature's Contribution, How Natural Capital Will Transform the Economic Recovery. I'm John Mon of the GDKP, the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership. For those of you who are with us for the first time, the GDKP is a global partnership of over 70 organizations dedicated to green growth across the policy, industry, and finance communities. As research program manager, I'm delighted to see so many of you joining us today, sharing our passion for nature and its contributions to our livelihoods. If you enjoyed today's webinar, we encourage you to join us again next week at the same time to explore a key yet very unexpected natural resource for the economic recovery, sand. That's right, sand. The GDKP is part of a consortium including the Green Economy Coalition, the Capitals Coalition, and WWF France. We banded together in what we call the Economics for Nature program, and the GDKP launched an interinstitutional expert group on natural capital. It's that group which is hosting today's webinar. We're grateful to the MAVA Foundation and to our many strategic partners, including GIZ's Economics of Land Degradation, and of course the OECD, for making today's discussion possible. It's really the right time to have it. We're at a critical crossroads for achieving balance between the human economy and nature. COVID-19 has underlined the urgent need to rebuild better, taking full account of our natural resilience to climate disasters, as well as zoonotic diseases emerging from food production. Never before has our productive relationship with nature been so starkly in view, as countries now work to finalize the post-2020 biodiversity framework, as we revise the system for national statistical accounts to include ecosystem accounts, and as we seek to achieve the SDGs in the next 10 years. We're working hard to bring nature back into the equation of human civilization. And never before has such an arsenal of tools existed for countries and the institutions that advise them to begin to fully value nature's contribution to green growth. Today, we'll explore some of those tools, including work from the GGKP expert group and work on natural capital accounting. But we won't focus only on research. This is not just methodologies. We want to move the buck. This is about action. We want to take a look at natural capital measurement in practice in countries. You have the opportunity today to decide for yourself what's most effective so that when we walk away from today's webinar, we can work together better towards our common goal. If you're not familiar with the GDKP, then I encourage you to visit our web platforms online and to join the growing community at gdkp.org forward slash subscribe. We welcome comments and questions throughout the webinar in the questions box. It's really a great opportunity for you to engage directly with this panel of experts. And after the webinar, we'd really appreciate it if you took one minute of your time to complete a short survey your feedback will really help us as we shape our future webinars. Also, I want to note that after the webinar is done, we will have a recording of it available online on our website at gkp.org. Today, we're very, very fortunate to be joined by a number of natural capital and green growth experts from the OECD, from University College London, from Conservation International, and from the Basque Center for Climate Change. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to welcome Kumi Kitamori. She's head of OECD's Green Growth and Global Relations Division. And it'd be great, Kumi, if you could tell us a little bit about OECD's work on green growth, as well as the upcoming 2020 Green Growth and Sustainable Development Forum. I understand it's taking place at the end of November. We're, we're excited to be a part of it. 
uh, and that for the first time you'll be focused on natural capital. Kumi, really thank you so much for being here. Okay, thank you, John, and thank you um, to the GGKP for the invitation for me to talk about the OECD work on green growth and uh, about the annual uh, forum event that we hold. The Green Growth and Sustainable Development Forum, or what I will call GGST Forum, it's an annual flagship green growth event of the OECD. And every year it focuses on different themes. And for this year, it's very close to the topic of this webinar. Um, it will take place in the last week of November on the theme of securing natural capital, resilience, risk management, and COVID-19. But before we get started on this um, theme of natural capital, let me talk a little bit about the OECD work on green growth and our natural, uh, annual GGST forum. The GGST forum was founded at the OECD with two key objectives. First um, is to serve as a platform for multidisciplinary dialogue on different aspects of green growth and sustainable development. OECD as an, um, an intergovernmental organization, the primary working method uh, at OECD is based on the many so-called policy committees. For example, we have Environment Policy Committee, Committee on Economic Policy, Committee on Fiscal Affairs, Tax Policies, Agriculture Policy Committee, Science and Technology and Innovation Committees, et cetera, et cetera. So these policy committees normally operate independently under the guidance of corresponding uh, government ministries and departments from member countries of the OECD. Now, the purpose of the green growth work at the OECD and then the GGSD forum in particular is to bring these different policy communities together so that they can have a multidisciplinary dialogue. So it's not just green-minded environmentalists talking to each other or people who are coming from the perspective of agricultural productivity, but the idea is to bring them together so we can um, have different perspective on the table. The second objective of uh, the Green Growth and Sustainable Development Forum at OECD is to identify knowledge gaps that could be addressed by future work of the OECD or by other organizations. Now, coming back to the, the theme of natural capital, originally uh, this year's GGSD forum was meant to be, as you see on the screen, securing natural capital, risk management, um, and resilience. But then as we entered 2020, we could not address and put this into the context of COVID-19. This pandemic has highlighted the vulnerabilities of our socioeconomic systems globally and expose the risks that natural capital degradation imposes on human health and also on our economies and, um, and societies. So the forum will consider different economic sectors that rely on natural capital and biodiversity, such as agriculture, forestry, fisheries, also tourism and some others, and how to balance their need for the continued sustainable use of the natural resources with the need for conservation. We will also see how this policy debate has been reshaped by COVID-19 um, and in the discussion of biodiversity, in the discussion of sustainable agriculture, sustainable fisheries, sustainable tourism. So we will try to bring different policymakers from different domains together uh, in these discussions. So, we will plan to have sessions on um, that will focus on best practices and opportunities and challenges for enhancing environmental sustainability in these sectors and also the workers who di directly depend on natural resources and we have a session on land-based natural capital and we will have a separate session on ocean-based natural capital the forum will also discuss what approaches can address both biodiversity and climate objectives together. In other words, how biodiversity and natural capital can help to increase the resilience of society to the impact of climate change. We will have um, uh, another session that will focus squarely on the measurement agenda. How can we measure progress towards securing life underwater and life uh, on land, that's SDG, 14 and 15. 
Now, this is a session that's being developed in cooperation with the GGKP expert group on natural capital, as John mentioned a while ago. And some of these experts who will be on the panel today to, in this webinar um, uh, have been contributing to shape this particular session of our forum in November. So we are very happy to be working with them. And also there will be a session that will address how to mobilize uh, financing for achieving the SDG targets on biodiversity. So for each of these sessions during this GGST forum at the OECD, by the way, it will be a webinar format, unfortunately, this year um, due to the travel restrictions. We will have a participation of relevant OECD committee chairs or delegates to inject the perspective of their, their own policy communities in addition to other national policymakers and experts from business, think tank, NGOs, and international organizations. So this way, the knowledge gaps identified can be channeled effectively to the future work of OECD under these respective policy committees. So that's enough from me, I think, uh, on the upcoming GGST forum at OECD. Uh, so that will be on the 24th and 25th and 26th of uh, November. And we look forward to having as many of, of you as possible uh, on that day as well. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Kumi. Uh, let me introduce myself. I have my welcome to uh, John's welcome earlier. Uh, my name is Joe Grice. Uh, from, I work my day job in the ONS in, in the UK. Um, but in this context, um, uh, I'm speaking as one of the co-chairs of the um, Natural Capital Expert Group. Uh, just very briefly to set the scene about the Natural Capital Expert Group, uh, it was set up at the very end of 2017 by GGKP uh, to take forward a project uh, which um, was being um, very helpfully financed by the Swiss Foundation MAVA. Uh, to encourage the use of natural capital in taking forward green and green growth uh, agendas. Uh, Paul Eakins, who you'll hear from um, in a, a few moments, in a few minutes, and I are the co-chairs of the group. And it has a very, very able and very active um, uh, uh, group of participants uh, at its centre. Um, the issue really facing um, the, the challenge that Maver had put to us, I think, is natural capital has been around for quite a while now as a concept. What's, why hasn't it made more of a contribution to the green growth agenda? Uh, why hasn't it been um, uh, taken forward more? Uh, what are the obstacles and what are the things that need to be um, uh, changed if we're going to fulfill the full potential of natural capital as a, as a tool? The, Work was launched at a two-day workshop uh, that the World Bank hosted in Washington at the end of 2017. And that workshop came up with a number of knowledge gaps which it felt the group should take forward and look at in more detail. Uh, those included uh, the issues of missing data and metrics, uh, the fact that the policy framework was sometimes piecemeal and not as well thought through as it might be, uh, issues concerned with infrastructure and how that fits into um, green growth and how natural capital can help for well-designed infrastructure. And also issues about finance and financial planning, where again, integrating traditional financial planning with uh, planning for uh, the environment, for, green, for the green economy, uh, very important to where natural capital seemed to be very relevant. So what you're going to hear about today is in many ways kind of the, the interim report or the first tranche of the work that's come out of the intervening period and a bit of a progress report. But let me say we do that very much in the spirit of not just sort of showing off here what we've done, uh, but actually from the point of view of raising awareness and to the extent that you uh, in your various guises are concerned with similar issues uh, 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 have um, contributions to make or would like to collaborate, then collaboration is very much what we're about. So we're delighted to hear from, from anyone in that, that instance. Now, the other thing I wanted to say just before I pass on is introduce our keynote speaker. 
And as you've heard from Kumi already, and as I'm sure everyone will already know, the OECD has long been at the forefront of the green growth agenda, and indeed in promoting natural capital. So when we came to look for a keynote speaker for this seminar, um, uh, Anthony Cox, who's the Deputy Director of the Environment Directorate at the OECD, immediately came to mind. Uh, we invited him to act as keynote speaker, and I'm delighted to say that he accepted. So I think all remains to me is to say welcome. Uh, thank you again to Anthony for taking this role, and let me hand over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. It's uh, great to be back with the GGKP once again and to and to provide some opening remarks for what promises to be a, a very interesting and engaging discussion this afternoon. Now, it, it's clear that, that while the pandemic will be resolved at, at some stage in the future, hopefully the near future, um, the underlying environmental challenges have not gone away. Um, we have issues that we are focused on this afternoon around the role of natural capital and biodiversity as core aspects of green growth, uh, as governments try to uh, build back better. And in my uh, scene setting remarks this afternoon, I'd just like to, fo to focus on four particular issues that we as a, as a community of experts need to keep in mind as we work to enhance the role of natural capital and biodiversity in, in what we hope uh, will be a green recovery. First, we need to heed the lessons of the past. We, we often say that you know, we can't let a good crisis go to waste. But this is exactly what happened from a green growth perspective following the global financial crisis in 2008. Following that crisis, gov governments uh, across the world injected some $3 trillion into the financial system. Around half a trillion of that stimulus could be classed as, as green measures. Now, the goal of this was to unfreeze credit markets and get the global economy working again. But instead of supporting the real economy, the bulk of the aid ended up in the financial sector. Governments bailed out the big investment banks that had directly contributed to the crisis. And when the economy got going again, it was those companies that reaped the rewards of the recovery. And taxpayers, for their part, were left with a global economy that was just as broken, just as unequal, and just as carbon intensive as before. So, so what happened to the green part of, this, of the stimulus? Well, a, a recent paper by my OECD colleagues, uh, Shaudul Agrawala, Damien Dusso, and Norbert Monti, reviewed the outcomes of, of the 2008 green stimulus measures. And, and the answer was that uh, the outcomes were decidedly mixed. Uh, there were some areas of success in terms of providing a short-term boost to growth and some that provided impetus with, with some longer lasting impacts. For example, some of the support to renewable energy innovation in the United States. But overall, the design and implementation of the measures left a lot to be desired. And there are sufficient concerns over the economic efficiency and environmental effectiveness of many of the measures. And this was compounded by a startling lack of ex post, ana ex -post analysis of the efficacy of many of these programs. So we need to learn the lessons from the last crisis. For example, one lesson is that policy evaluation needs to be an integral part of the green stimulus measures and not an afterthought. Secondly, we, we have to have whole of government coordination if we are going to be able to identify and mitigate the potential divergences in the pursuit of different policy objectives. And we need to uh, ensure that we have proper flanking instruments, proper flanking policy instruments, if we fix the underlying environmental externalities that will still be in place when we come out of the, pan the pandemic. If we're going to get greater environmental benefits from whatever green stimulus is put in place. Second, the, the, interconnectedness, the interconnectedness of our economic, social and environmental systems has been highlighted as never before. Close to three quarters of emerging infectious diseases in humans come from other, other, from other animals. You know, land use change and wildlife exploitation have dramatically increased the infectious disease risk and the risk of zoonotic disease. And 
we've found, we know that the economy and human well-being also depend on biodiversity for food, uh, clean water, flood protection, erosion control, inspiration for innovation, and much, much more. Over half the world's global domestic product is moderately or highly dependent on biodiversity. And so the ongoing decline of biodiversity and natural capital therefore poses important risks to society. And investing in natural capital and biodiversity as part of the policy response is essential to help minimise those risks while also providing immediate jobs and economic stimulus. And this has really brought the issue of resilience to the forefront of the political discussion. Now, while phrases such as enhancing economic or climate environmental social systems resilience roll nicely off the tongue putting a resilience focus into practice is a different matter and it is increasingly clear that COVID-19 was not some random unpredictable event and that it was directly linked to the systems pressure that we have been putting on the environment in which we live. So if we're going to reduce the chance of similar pandemics or indeed other environmental risks into the future, we must become far more aware of the extent of the pressures that we are placing on the environment and hence on the economic and social systems. Now a core part of that is monitoring, assessment and evaluation of policies across the board, not just in the environment, but across the board. Uh, and this has to be a core part of the business of, gov of governments now more than ever before. And groups like the GGKP and this event with its focus on natural capital and biodiversity have a critical role to play here. Third, and building on that, natural capital is now seen as being part of the solution. Governments are increasingly signalling a, a strong desire to incorporate nature-based solutions into their recovery plans. This, these nature-based solutions have indeed been a, a, a key feature of, the, uh, of this year's G20 discussions on climate and, and adaptation. But moving from plans and statements to Im implementation is still, I'm afraid, very much in its infancy. And so reports such as the recent OECD report on nature-based solutions for adapting to water-related climate risks are the kind of products and the kind of outputs that are designed to help governments make that Transform, transformative leap. And we're also seeing that businesses are increasingly recognising that the loss of nature poses a direct threat to their economic activities and to their profitability and, bot, and, and bottom line. They see that nature based, that nature related risks can impact their operations and supply chains much faster than say climate risks in a number of important areas. But of course, there are familiar challenges here around measurement, around the definition of environmental materiality and finance risks, and how to develop systems for uh, nature-related financial disclosures. There are, some, there are some steps in the right direction here uh, to address this through business initiatives such as the Science-Based Targets Initiative and the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. And I think we need to step up these efforts. Finally, uh, we need to keep a close eye on what governments are doing in the recovery with respect to natural capital and biodiversity. The OECD recently convened, uh, just last month in fact, a ministerial council round table on the green recovery where ministers from OECD and key partner, con key partner countries pooled their ambition and their experiences to date in driving a green recovery. Now, much of it was aspirational, uh, but there were very positive statements. They focused very much on the need to enhance re resilience, uh, the importance of sustainable finance. They underscored the role of multilateral approaches um, and harnessing the potential of investment in green sector for job creation and new businesses. Um, and indeed, we've seen a number of countries actually put this into place, at least in terms of plans. We've had some some positive measures from policy from um, uh, in terms of the recovery and stimulus measures such as uh, changes to regulation on wildlife trade to protect human health, um, job programs focused on ecosystem restoration, sustainable forest management, invasive species species control, to name but a few. But we've also seen measures heading in the opposite direction. 
We've seen gov gov we have seen governments uh, weaken land use, pol land use policies, uh, alter waste collection requ requirements, reduce air and agricultural pollution standards, relax project permitting processes. Uh, and some countries have also introduced subsidies that are potentially harmful to, bi to, bi to biodiversity or have temporarily waived or reduced biodiversity relevant taxes, charges and fees. So uh, last week we released a policy br br brief from the OECD that focused on, uh, but on, bi on biodiversity and the economic response to, co to COVID that laid out a step, a series of steps that governments can take to integrate biodiversity and natural capital considerations into their recovery plans and drive the transformative changes that are, need, that are, need, that are needed to halt and then reverse bi biodiversity loss. Joe, let me conclude by highlighting once again that um, it's not just the important role of natural capital and biodiversity in driving the green recovery that we need to focus on today, but also the ongoing challenges we face in terms of measurement, monitoring and evaluation in this, in this process. And groups like the uh, expert group that you are helping to lead and sessions like today's GGKP event uh, that are focused on measuring nature's contribution to the recovery are really critical in supporting this. So thanks for your attention. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. And I wish you all the best for the rest of the, we of the, the webinar. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Anthony. Um, the, what you set out is so compelling and so forceful. Again, you have to ask why uh, has progress not been uh, more rapid in some of these agendas? I think it all comes down to, um, this is about implementation, working out what are the barriers and putting those, uh, dismantling those barriers to progress systematically and um, uh, comprehensively. Um, um, let me just say a little bit about how we're planning to, to, to arrange the rest of the, the session. Um, we will hear in a moment from uh, Paul Eakins, who will summarise the uh, research uh, findings uh, from the uh, work so far. We also thought, though, it would be um, uh, good to have a couple of practical um, uh, accounts of how work on the ground can be taken forward. So we'll also hear from Rosemary uh, Portilla and Amil Markianda. Um, we hope that will leave us time for questions at the end. We'll take questions after Paul's session, uh, if people have them, and I can see already from the chat that a number of questions have emerged. Um, we might then store up other questions for a little discussion at the end of the, of the time. Uh, so we'll go straight from Rosemary's presentation into Anil's uh, uh, presentation and store up questions for the discussion at the end. In terms of time finish, we're due to finish at uh, 16.30 um, Central European time. Um, uh, if the discussion is still going uh, hot foot at that stage, we might go on for a few minutes beyond that. But I am conscious that people have very busy agendas, so um, we won't go on indefinitely by any means. Uh, and we'll play it a little bit by uh, when we get to that point. Uh, but I hope there'll be plenty of time for questions and discussion. Uh, at the end of the of the presentations. So let me not waste any more time and uh, introduce uh, Paul Eakins, who as well as co-chairing uh, this group has a not unbusy day job as director of the uh, Institute of Sustainable Resources at University College London. Uh, I've been delighted to work with Paul over the last few years, uh, but I very much look forward, Paul, to, uh, to your uh, presentation today. So please. Well, thank you very much, Joe, and uh, for that kind introduction. And uh, I'll just start by saying that, um, for reasons I won't bore you with uh, the audience with, I'm uh, uh, giving this presentation from a public place, and therefore there may be the odd noises off, but um, uh, it's as quiet as, as I could find, and I, I think we'll get through it perfectly happily. So um, I've got the job of summarizing the couple of years' work that the uh, natural capital project of the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership has engaged in. Uh, next slide, please, Jessica. And you can see there that we've commissioned 
and published five papers. There is the link where, to the GGKP website where you can find those papers. I'm going to skip very quickly through them. Um, as uh, Joe said right at the beginning, they cover three topics, uh, data, metrics, and policy. Um, the second of the two metrics papers uh, by Anil Makandia, uh, I'm going to skip over completely because we uh, fortunately have Anil with us and I think that's what he's going to talk about. So I'm going to talk very briefly about the other four papers. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the one about data, which is again something that uh, Anthony highlighted in his uh, in his work. This was a paper by uh, the World Conservation Monitoring Centre at the University of Cambridge, and they were asked to look at all the various tools and platforms uh, that exist that that could help in uh, using natural capital information for policy purposes. And of course, it's using them for policy purposes that we're particularly interested in here. And um, there's no shortage of data, so that's the first thing to say. Um, but obviously data is not information, which is not knowledge, and even less is it, is it wisdom. And despite all this data, uh, there are significant gaps in information. And because there are significant gaps in information, there are significant gaps in user uptake of this information. I'm not going to go through in detail all those uh, all, all those points um, because you can read them for yourself and uh, obviously if you have questions about them so much the better um, they did identify that the desirable characteristics of natural capital information sources be they platforms or tools or databases or whatever are relevant obviously we need to be um, measuring things that we care about accessibility uh, people need to be able to access the data transparency they need to be able to see where it's come from and what it means and then flexibility so that they can use it for different purposes uh, next slide please so having identified the gaps uh, the paper went on to have a look at recommendations and obviously the recommendations uh, try to address the gaps so um, trying to make sure it, it remains the case that policymakers uh, and probably most people remain much more concerned about the socio-economy than they do about uh, nature. I regret that, and I hope that's not true for me, but I think it probably is true for policymakers and, and the people that they serve. And therefore, we, we need to make clear how natural capital is related to the socio-economy. Um, Anthony uh, spelled out a lot of very important points there, but I think it, it isn't yet generally recognized, for example, that COVID-19, as Anthony said, was both a predictable and a predicted um, uh, thing of, of, of the uh, outcome of the way in which we, we tend to treat the natural world. Surprisingly, there's a gap which needs to be filled on the linking of data for indicators for reporting against international commitments. There are lots of international commitments that governments have signed up to, but there is still a lack of data that enables them to really um, see, see, see what they're doing on that. We need to engage with providers of big data and that obviously is, is a huge issue because big data is huge and uh, there are floods of data coming in from satellites etc and in order to do that we'll have to scale up artificial intelligence. And then there's the gaps in user uptake, um, the interoperability between platforms and tools, reusability of outputs and models, you can't expect policymakers to uh, learn uh, from scratch all the, all the new things that come on stream, um, increased capacity in the public domain, data platforms and tools, um, the, 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 they're not as transparent and flexible as they might be, so you have to invest a lot of effort into, in, into understanding them, and then linking them with natural capital frameworks and a common natural capital data language. So you can see we're still relatively in the foothills of the whole of this um, information revolution that we need to uh, that, that, that we need to address. Next slide, please. And talking of um, natural capital frameworks, uh, that's what this slide is intended to show. It's uh, a fairly well known information pyramid. There, you've got basic statistics at the bottom, which are the kind of data that I was talking about. Then you've got natural capital accounts, and there we have uh, reference to the SIA. Um, 
uh, and uh, the, the system of environmental economic accounts, which Rosie Mir is going to talk about uh, immediately after me. And then we come to the indicators, which uh, is, the, is the purpose of the next paper that we were looking at. Um, uh, and this in particular, a, a, a natural capital indicator framework. And then we come up to the key indicators, which is really what the policymakers need if they're going to be, um, uh, if that information is going to be effectively used. And there's still a long way to go in making that kind of information pyramid uh, operational. Next slide, please. And this is the natural capital indicator framework that we came up with. Um, those of you who know natural capital will not be surprised by anything there. On the left, you've actually got the assets, the ecosystem assets, and all the various commodity assets. Uh, these produce flows which are useful for people. And as we go to the right of the figure there, this produce outputs, which includes benefits in particular, and that's what we're interested in. And there's a whole list there of benefits coming from natural capital, some of which you can put money values on and some of which you can't. And then they also produce residuals because we've mobilized large quantities of materials from the natural capital base, which become residuals, um, emissions to air, emissions to water and emissions to land. Um, this process of turning natural capital flows into outputs often requires human inputs and that needs to be taken into account as well. And so this is the framework that we came up with, which uh, we are very much hoping to make operational over the next year or two. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a rather flashier uh, version of the same picture, which I'll leave you to look at at your leisure. Uh, it's one that will be appearing in the journal Ecosystem Services, and I'm very pleased that we were able to get this uh, indicator framework into there, because really that's the first step to getting any kind of scientific credibility for a new uh, reporting framework of this kind. Next slide, please. Okay, well, we've said we've been talking about data, we've talked a bit about metrics. The whole purpose of data and metrics in this context, of course, uh, is to help policymakers. And the policymakers and the organizations that work with them uh, are well aware of that, and there's a great list there of uh, policy frameworks for green growth, which use the concept of natural capital, including, of course, the four founding partners of GGKP, which are the first four organizations there, but there are lots of others listed there as well. And um, we reviewed those policy frameworks, we reviewed the uh, policy options that they have um, uh, articulated in order to uh, safeguard, conserve, uh, and restore natural capital. And we've uh, grouped them under those five headings that you see there, policy and planning, uh, regulations, uh, finance and investment, uh, operational issues, and technical issues. And if you go to that paper, you'll see uh, the very long lists of policies which have been used uh, under those headings. Um, and uh, in a way, that's a... Uh, Yes, yeah, a sign of success that policymakers have been very creative in utilizing this concept of natural capital. Next slide, please. So that we put together a framework for analyzing the policy use of natural capital. Um, there's an overarching goal of recognizing the environment as a capital asset, and we still don't do that very often. Uh, we still don't routinely have um, uh, inclusive wealth measurements that uh, will tell uh, policymakers uh, whether the uh, economic growth that they're experiencing is coming from depleting the natural capital stock, which it very often is, or whether it's actually uh, being used uh, sustainably. So we, we need to recognize that in our systems. Um, we need to think about the components of natural capital, the natural assets, the flows, the human inputs and the outputs. Those are the four elements in the natural capital indicator framework, which I was talking about earlier. And then we need to think about the policy elements. Natural capital is complex and you will nearly always need a policy mix in order to address natural capital issues effectively. And we need to ensure that a comprehensive and appropriate suite of policy instruments is considered. Next slide, please. So this comes on to the fourth 
uh, of the uh, papers I'm going to talk about, which is the use of natural capital analysis in policy. And uh, a fascinating picture there of publications. We did a, a literature search and identified these 340 documents. And uh, for me, it was very telling that the first year uh, where you can see on the left there where we found any publications was 1989. And that, of course, was the year that uh, the great uh, environmental economist David Pierce, um, my predecessor at University College London, as it happens, um, he published the blueprint for a green economy and really put into the policy making domain um, at a high profile the concept of, of natural capital. But you can see that it took a long time for uh, both the grey literature and the academic literature to uh, really start to explore that concept. And it's really interesting to me as an academic that the academics seem to have been rather behind the policymakers because the grey bars, which are the grey literature, uh, are actually, as you can see, far more numerous uh, in every year than, than the white bars. Well, except 2013, I notice now, but um, and 2019, which is interesting. So let's move on then to the next slide. So what did we find? Um, well, it was fascinating. Uh, there's lots of studies on ecosystems, and that's not surprising because obviously that's one of the absolutely core components of natural capital thinking. And there's lots of uses of natural capital accounting. And again, that's not surprising. The uh, elements of the SEER were being put in place in the early 1990s. Um, the first uh, SEER was, was agreed, I think, in 1993. So there's been quite a, a long time when people have been looking at that. But then we were absolutely astonished to find, and this goes right back to what Anthony Cox was saying, that only two papers actually reported on the policy impact of the use of natural capital information in decision making. So policymakers are using the idea of natural capital, not as often as I would wish, but they are using it. What they're not doing is doing evaluation after they've used the concept to find out whether the policies have actually improved the natural capital situation or not. So we then categorized the papers further, obviously, in terms of the um, government decisions, uh, policy planning, regulatory, finance, investment, operational and technical, that's the same policy making categorization that we used before. We looked at the type of natural capital metrics and data. We looked at the type of stocks and the flows. And um, one of the efforts that we organized right at the beginning of the GGKP uh, project on natural capital was a workshop at Stanford, where there's um, a very lively uh, natural capital research program called the Natural Capital Project. And we came up with those other uh, criteria there for uh, how one might think about how policymakers are using um, are, are using natural capital. So um, uh, that's uh, that's it. Uh, those are the four papers we've produced. They're beautifully produced, and they're on the GGKP website. So I hope that uh, many of you will use the link that are on these slides. And um, very happy to take some questions now from you if uh, if you have any. Oh, there's one more slide uh, which I forgot about. Um, let's just have that last slide uh, back again, Jessica, if we may. And uh, I don't need to talk about it. We'll just keep it on the screen. Just keep it on the screen uh, if there are any questions. Um, uh, these are our recommendations, which are fairly obvious from the kind of uh, discussion that I've been uh, I've been having here. So, Joe, over to you, and then perhaps you could see if there are any questions, uh, and I'll do my best to answer them. <laughs> Well, there's certainly no shortage of questions. I've been looking at the questions coming in, and there are many, many of them. Uh, but maybe there are three uh, groupings uh, of the ones I've, I've been looking at that perhaps I could put to you. Uh, the one is um, social justice. Um, uh, how does social justice fit in with this agenda of green growth? It's one thing to have an agenda for the for a green agenda, it's one thing to have a growth agenda. But are some of the issues and some of the obstacles actually in the field of who gets who benefits and social justice. So that was one uh, aspect. Are we doing, are we taking enough account of that? Uh, the second one is number of questions and comments relate to uh, inclusive wealth, but in particular, I think to uh, how do we deal with uh, the GDP domination issue that GDP gets taken incredibly seriously, uh, but you can go on as much as you like about natural capital and other dimensions of well-being. 
uh, but they don't get taken seriously. How do we deal with that? Uh, and in particular, for example, how do we get national governments and credit rating agencies and, for that matter, international surveillance to take these wider measures seriously? Uh, and then a third one that struck me as very important uh, was skills. Um, are we paying enough attention to the fact that the skills available for some of these things that you and indeed Anthony talked about are not available in depth in many countries? In particular, how uh, does there need to be a richer skill base for integrated policy making, the kind you were talking about, uh, and for that matter, actually implementing nature based solutions and driving forward these policies, uh, even if governments accept them? So those are three questions, three groupings of questions that struck me as particularly interesting and very useful to have your views on that. Well, thank you, Joe. And um, as you will know, and as I'm sure our audience will know, they're all big questions and uh, ones that I can hardly do justice with in a very brief period of time that I have. On the skills issue, I think I'm absolutely passionate about this because um, that is something where we really do need to upskill enormously. Uh, everything right from the statistical offices in developing countries, and I think the four organizations behind GGKP are doing enormously good work, and then lots of the other GGKP partners are too. But it is a huge task because data generation and the getting of information out of data is expensive. And um, then once you've got it, obviously, you have to know what to do with it. Um, I mean, I know enough about agriculture to know that uh, sustainable agriculture that feeds. Uh, the 9 billion people who will be here in 2050 uh, without uh, destroying biodiversity is possible. And, and I know that uh, it's been practiced, uh, but at the moment at a very small scale, and lots of people wouldn't know how to practice or how to do it. Um, so the skills issue is huge, and, and one that really does need to be addressed by governments and civil society processes and businesses everywhere if we're really going to start taking care of natural capital. On GDP, the first thing I would say is that um, one of the things that the COVID crisis has taught me is that GDP is not in fact king, as you often hear from questions of this kind. Um, the UK was prepared to take a hit of 20% uh, on its GDP in order to keep people safe. So when we really care about other things, we are prepared to put GDP in second place. The second thing I'd say is that GDP is a useful number. An enormous amount of work has gone into it. Uh, it does measure average incomes, um, and it can also be split down into distributional terms, and people care about income. I don't think I've ever met anyone who doesn't care about income. So it is useful. Of course, it is not the be all and end all. And uh, as part of my academic life, I spent a lot of time uh, working particularly on indicators of strong environmental sustainability that I think could complement GDP. And of course, I'm aware of the huge efforts that have gone into going in the whole beyond GDP agenda. But I'm afraid the reality of the matter is that policymakers tend not to take anything except GDP seriously because the public doesn't, and the public doesn't vote consistently for policymakers who would take those sorts of things seriously. And um, uh, that's difficult. It's a hard truth that I've had to learn. And obviously, uh, I think science has a, has a strong and important role to play in emphasizing the importance of natural capital to human welfare, which is what GDP is supposed to contribute to. But I'm afraid we still have a lot of work to do with that. And on the social justice issue, again, a, a hugely important and relevant topic. Um, again, everyone listening to this, I'm sure, is aware that we live in a hugely unjust world, and that's a political issue. We could do lots more about that than we do do, um, and unfortunately, um, the politicians either don't want to do it, or they find they don't get the political support in order to enable them to do it. Uh, Linking that to natural capital, it is to me perfectly possible to imagine an environmentally sustainable society that remains as unjust as the present society is today. Uh, I, I would hope that that wouldn't be the case. And so I'm fully in favor of the inclusive green growth agenda, which organizations like the OECD and UNEP and GGGI um, and the World Bank are always talking about. 
But the fact of the matter is that our current economy is not inclusive, and the people who have the political power to make it inclusive um, don't give that a high enough priority in order to it, let it take effect. Um, so what I do have to say is that uh, what we know is scientifically is that if we don't get the natural capital agenda sorted out and the broader environmental agenda, the people who will suffer first will suffer worst and who are indeed already suffering are the people who are at the bottom of the current very unjust situation that we face. So uh, natural capital um, policy is in itself, I think, uh, socially just, but, but whether or not, not it will lead to a more socially just society uh, is certainly uh, subject to political decisions that are well past my pay grade as a mere scientist. Back to you, Joe. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, big questions, as you say, uh, but maybe some pointers actually for some of our work as we go forward too, you know, things that we might pay a little more attention to, uh, particularly the skills issue is one that I think is, is as you say, very important and in, indeed our questions say. Maybe at this point we should move on. I know there's a lot of other really interesting questions which I've um, uh, been logging, but maybe at this point we should move on to the other two presentations and then we'll give ourselves time for a, uh, a decent um, panel discussion at the, um, at the end of the proceedings. So if I may, Paul, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, thank you. It's uh, really a very exciting agenda you're talking about and very exciting work. Um, but let me now move on. Uh, as I said, we would uh, have a couple of more practical um, uh, presentations on um, things that are actually happening on the ground. And the first of these is from Rosie Mary uh, Portiva, who uh, again will need not much introduction, but is uh, Senior Director at Conservation International. Uh, so Rosie Mary, let me, let me hand over to you. Thank you very much, Joe. Can you hear me just fine? Yes. Um, thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, thank JJKP for the opportunity um, that's given to us to um, present our work on ecosystem accounting in Liberia, exploring some of the initial policy applications that we have. Next slide, please. I'd like to start with a few words uh, on the system of environmental economic accounting which is the accepted international standard for environmental economic accounting on par with the system of national accounts, which ultimately lead to the generation of indicators such as GDP as we were talking um, previously. There are two complementary approaches aligned with the, the SNA, and these are the central framework, which looks into environmental assets, such as water, fisheries, energy, um, and how they're used in the economy uh, and return to the environment in terms of waste and emissions. Um, this is already the um, accepted as international statistical standard since 2012. Um, the central framework is complemented by ecosystem accounts, which takes the perspective of the environment and the provision of goods and service um, to livelihoods and economies. It really looks into interactions within ecosystems in a certain given area and how those contribute to um, the economy by attributing monetary values to those benefits. Next. The ecosystem accounting is now currently implemented in dozens of countries around the world, in all regions of the world. Um, and the scope and the scale varies according to country priority needs um, as well as availability of data. In some cases, it's um, presented at the national level, um, in others at subnational level with the idea of scaling up. And in some other cases, um, we have implementation of both subnational and national level. And this is the case of Liberia. Next where we have been working for the last um, few years. Liberia is a country in the western uh, coast of Africa. Um, it has about 5 million people, um, 111,000 square kilometers, um, and it has um, one of the largest intact uh, west forests in Africa, which are very important habitat 
to um, threatened species like um, the western chimpanzee, like the forest elephant, uh, and the uh, pygmy hippo. So um, the fact that it's intact, the fact that uh, Liberia is less dense, densely populated than many other of its neighbors makes it a very important hotspot for biodiversity conservation. But Liberia is also a very poor country. About 60% of the population live under the poverty line um, and are um, greatly dependent on many of the um, forest benefits. Um, bushmeat is um, commonly consumed, um, both in rural areas as well as in, in urban centers. There is a great reliance on wood and charcoal for food um, production. Um, there is um, a great deal of lack of access to clean water. And overall, the country whose population lives mostly around the coastal areas relies uh, very much on fisheries. Mangroves play a very important role here uh, in terms of providing nurseries for those fisheries as well as food in terms of um, um, crustaceans. Um, Liberia uh, is very much in need of um, economic development. There is great um, socioeconomic political pressure toward that end after um, the years of civil war that very much you know, destroy, destroyed a um, um, good part of the infrastructure in the country. But the question is, how will Liberia develop? What is the development path that acknowledges um, the great um, resources, natural resources, and um, its population dependency? Next. So in 2016, a group of um, conservation international scientists did um, a first um, national scale assessment on what we called essential natural capital, which represented, you know, biodiversity that was import, is important at the global level, as well as food, water, and, and carbon. Um, and we found out that um, most of it, uh, most of the high, what we call most essential natural capital remains relatively intact, but it's mostly unprotected um, and under the threat. Um, there is a great degree of you know, the forest concessions and timber exploitation, which um, is, represents um, an important contribution to the GDP. And that, you know, ultimately, um, in order to, you know, pass um, uh, the, the development, the country really needs to look into management strategies that looks into um, sustainable production as well as communities, um, especially um, those communities that live um, in coastal areas, for example. Um, so that project gave the impetus for the government to embrace accounting as something that is more systematic, that can be repeated over time, and that showcase the trends of natural resource use and contribution to the economy. Next. So um, just um, a couple of years ago, we started working with the government of Liberia to implement ecosystem accounts. Um, and this is, you know, like many developing countries, uh, certainly a challenging place from the perspective of data, data availability. Um, like many countries, um, Liberia doesn't have a robust uh, or accurate um, dis distribution, a map of, of, of ecosystem classes distribution. Um, so that was the initial step that for us is to develop those maps, working on the high-level partnership with the U.S. space agent, NASA, um, CI, and the government of Liberia. We developed uh, low-cost replicable tools for the development of those maps that would entail um, high-resolution satellite imageries um, and um, that would land, um, result into a map of land cover and land accounts, which are part of the central framework, and um, with a combination of species distribution and some environmental conditions to the first um, detailed um, map of ecosystem classes in Liberia, which is now fully endorsed by the government. 
uh, and will contribute to um, the project that we are starting uh, um, to develop on ecosystem accounts in coastal areas with a focus on mangroves, um, with um, the global environmental facility support. Um, the development of those maps are ongoing in Botswana uh, as well and are in the latest stages of development as well as in Gabon. Next. So having these um, extend um, the ecosystem classes distribution from 2000 to 2018 um, already um, enabled us to develop at the national scale the ecosystem expand accounts, which are the first set of um, ecosystem accounts. And they are now being used on informing the revision of Liberia national nationally determined contribution as part of the um, Paris Agreement, um, and then um, helping Liberia to embrace um, and more um, aggressive, so to speak, um, work towards emission, um, CO2 emissions and sequestration. Um, the accounts will also help to um, inform the monitoring of the um, energy NDC targets as agreed upon by the country, as well as to inform uh, field-based measurements on the co-benefits um, and, and human well-being. Uh, this is just the beginning of a range of other policy applications that we are exploring. Um, those maps are already being used in, in reporting with the development of the State of Environmental Report in Liberia. Um, are used to inform legislation, um, is inclu including the wildlife legislation that is currently under revision as well, and that our work will hopefully um, contribute to from the perspective of having a better sense of the dependence of a wildlife in the country, um, to include ecosystem services into impact assessment, um, and, and more broadly speaking, on spatial planning from the perspective of siting of interventions, infrastructure, protected areas, et cetera. Next. I would like to um, wrap my intervention here by speaking about how this experience and, and the work in other countries um, have um, you know, some of our initial thoughts um, on what it needs to move forward and scaling the adoption of the CEO ecosystem accounting globally. Uh, we very much strongly believe that advancing the guidelines is a major step forward and are very much hope, hopeful that we'll have the adoption of ecosystem accounting as a statistical standard um, early next year. Uh, we also think that it's really quite important that we advance um, methods and tools and that includes global data da databases, as we saw in a previous uh, uh, intervention by Paul, really quite important. And I'd like to call the attention to the group of Earth, uh, group on Earth observation uh, for ecosystem accounting, which is really working towards um, guidelines and on the development of platforms, accessibility of better quality data and on the concept of ecosystem accounting ready data that will certainly facilitate adoption. Last but not least, capacity is really quite important. Many of the countries we work on um, really um, de depend on, on capacity enhancement, but those ultimately are country-led efforts that with our support, the financial and technical, um, and with the capacity building, from research organizations, much like the work we are doing with NASA um, and, and, and other organizations, can really help the countries to um, base their first steps toward account, uh, tailoring their efforts toward um, priority policies. Thank you very much, um, and I'll be very happy to uh, answer questions once we, um, once we go to Q&A. Well, thank you very much, Rosa Mary. Um, and um, again, uh, I can already see that uh, your presentation has prompted a lot of questions, which uh, we'll perhaps try to round up as we get to the question, as we get to the panel session, as you as you say. So we're a little bit behind where we'd hope to be, not very far. 
but maybe I can therefore pass directly to the next um, presentation. Uh, this is uh, Anil Makianda's um, uh, presentation. Uh, Paul uh, Eakins already referred to Anil's work. Uh, Anil again will need very little introduction, if any, uh, but he's a distinguished service professor at the Basque Center for um, uh, Climate Change. And um, uh, the SDGs are obviously uh, a very important uh, peg for some of these agendas. Uh, the SDGs get a lot of attention internationally. So to that extent, the relationship between the things we're talking about this afternoon and the SDGs is very important. But Anil, let me hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, my presentation is going to fill in the gap with uh, the one uh, bit of work which uh, Paul did not mention, in the, which is on the metrics uh, of uh, natural capital. And this related to trying to relate the um, natural capital uh, to the SDGs. And there are several SDGs, which each country is following, which can be linked to the, to a shortage of natural capital, or in other words, the amount by which natural capital would have to increase for the SDGs to be met. So in the work that we did with uh, for GGKP with my colleagues, um, we estimated the, that gap. We estimated the extent to which uh, the meeting the SDGs would require an increase in natural capital. And we found it was a significant amount um, uh, globally. And then we wanted to do a deep dive to look at the relationship between um, particular programs in countries uh, and, and the uh, relating to the SDGs and the um, natural capital that would be involved if those programs were to be successful. And the case study we chose, we are go we're going to cite here, is from India. So the next slide, please. Uh, the area in India is in Bundelkund in Madhya Pradesh, in the state of Madhya Pradesh, which is quite a, a, a relatively deprived area. Uh, where the issue is really one of land degradation that was being addressed. So environmentally, it's an area with uh, relatively reduced falling part precipitation, reduced water table, and some shift in monsoon. Um, socially, it, there's been significant seasonal migration. The human development index is among the lowest in the country. There's a lot of child mal malnourishment, farmer suicide, and population below the poverty line is higher than average. And it's in, economically, the data show per capita income is lower than the national average. 67% population in agriculture, many of them work on small and marginal pieces of land, uh, fragmented land. Now the map shows where the where it is in the center of the country. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we work. This work was done in conjunction with colleagues at Development Alternatives, who have been involved uh, for over 30 years on land remediation programs. And what they did, which was very fortunate, was that in this case they not only were engaged in programs relating to sustainable agriculture, watershed development, uh, climate adapt adaptive planning and natural ecosystem conservation. Um, the, and, but they also took the trouble to record the conditions that existed before they went in and to keep track of uh, uh, areas which they did not engage in, which were similar to the ones where they did. So we had control groups against whom we could compare uh, the results of their of their interventions uh, and the interventions related to the areas I've just described. Uh, next slide please. So the the project what it, it did was is trying to relating to providing a measure of natural capital by valuing land as a function of how it is used. And this estimated the value of the ecosystem services, and through that, the augmented value of natural capital 
which should emerge if you undertook these the, these uh, programs which combined better management of land with with more careful uh, with, with greater care to biodiversity and to the uh, and to the natural resources. So out of the 186 villages where development alternatives did intervene, a comparison was made between changes in ecosystem services in a subset of those against this control group. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is essentially what's involved in methodology. It's, 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 it's involved, it's complicated. Um, you need a lot of primary and, and secondary research. And as Rosemary said, a, it, it involves a GIS based mapping, which is often not available in, the, in these areas. So you have to undertake the remote sensing uh, uh, construction of maps. And then uh, the use of uh, different uh, pieces of software which have been developed over time, which are available in the public domain. And the one which was used a lot here was the INVEST program. So through this combination of, of uh, data uh, of data mapping, this is combined with evaluation of the natural capital, which I will talk about next. Uh, next slide, please. So what did we find? Well, we did two kinds of assessments. One which would be what would be more the traditional benefit cost kind of analysis, and the other which was based more on this on a capitals approach, where we looked at the increases in natural capital, but also to, to the extent possible the changes in social and human capital. So the benefits that were valued included uh, crop and livestock incomes, uh, timber and non-timber forest products, it's a measure of the change in biodiversity, which was measured through index, index of mean species abundance, and then changes in carbon sequestration. And the traditional approach found a very high benefit to cost ratios from the remediation which is obtained with biodiversity and carbon benefits accounting for an important part of the benefits. They were not the dominant ones. The, the dominant benefits came from improvements in crop productivity and livestock management, but biodiversity and carbon benefits were certainly significant. Uh, next slide, please. So the capital approach then looked at how much the the, 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 this program had increased natural capital in the areas in which it was it was implemented, and uh, compared that to the financial investments that had to be made. So we found that the natural capital increase was more than a hundred times the financial investments that were that were that were had to be uh, allocated. Social capital was also evaluated, but it could only be evaluated qualitatively. And the study found that as a result of the program, there was less out migration and stronger social institutions in the intervention areas. So the program uh, contributed to the national goal SDG of uh, seven to 10% revival of representative ecosystems and a 5% increase in agricultural production systems at a very modest cost. So the, the, the capital's approach, we would argue, allowed for the assessment of the cost effectiveness of the measures in achieving target increases in natural capital. If, you are, if we do take an SDG approach, which is the one which most countries are committed to, it's not really appropriate to use benefit cost analysis because if the benefits turn out to be less than the cost, that doesn't mean we shouldn't follow of, of achieving an SDG. It doesn't mean that that SDG should not be should not be uh, attained. But but what we can do is uh, um, is to is to see if we can convert the SDG target into a natural capital target, and then look at the least cost ways of getting to that natural capital target. This could be a very useful way of bringing natural capital into uh, the 
policy debate. I saw someone in the chat saying, how can countries uh, like uh, Myanmar, for example, or in other developing countries use it? Well, this is something that could certainly be done there. But to do it is a little bit, uh, it, 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 it requires a, a fairly da intensive data collection, and it requires the data to be collected at the beginning, at the time you st you initiate the 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 uh, uh, remediation or other other programs, and to track it through over time, and through that you'll find out ways in which you will be able to see ways in which uh, resources can be allocated to achieve the SDGs in a way which is most cost effective. Thank you very much. Well, again, Daniel, thank you very much. And uh, you've been looking at, and I'm sure and I have the questions that have been coming in as you've been uh, talking. Uh, we've got about uh, 20 minutes or so for um, uh, the panel discussion, uh, questions and answers. Um, um, so if I could invite the, the panelists to um, uh, unmute themselves. Um, <laughs> um, and let me start by uh, Paul Eakins talked quite a bit about the issue of skills and um, the light of the work uh, in particular that uh, you've been doing, Rosie Mary and um, Anil. Um, one question that struck me was, are we actually exploiting the capabilities of the inverted commas, the poor, uh, to the extent that we can? Do we actually assume that they are in need of external assistance when actually we could be um, utilizing the capabilities of um, uh, those that we work with to a much greater extent. But it's also more interesting more generally to have few views on skills and what we should be doing about that. Uh, indeed, well, it's an issue we should be looking at as we go forward with this work in this project. Rosemary, perhaps you'd like to start. Yeah, um, I would say that, you know, as I mentioned, uh, we see the implementation of ecosystem accounting as a country-led effort. Our role is to provide support for some of those um, initial steps. Um, we want to get ourselves out of the job. We want to create the capacity, uh, generate, um, so work with the government to um, develop the institutional frameworks that would allow for uh, the collaboration amongst uh, the range of organizations and the experts that are needed to develop those accounts. So our our uh, modus operandi is by facilitating um, and enhancing the capacity so that they can, you know, um, continue to do that over time. We, the the uh, accounting is not a one-off exercise, but rather uh, uh, continue systematically done and repeatedly done so we can understand the trends. So I would like to emphasize that, you know, the importance of this work that we do with NASA is in its um, a low cost and replicability that is possible uh, for the countries um, that are, you know, have limited capacity to do that on their own um, because the algorithms are developed uh, and they run on cloud, and so they can do it on their own countries um, with their um, local experts. And we just um, are there to, you know, provide um, that initial support um, towards that that goal. I think I can I can agree with that. Uh, certainly, the the amount of uh... Uh, software and tools that are available now are, are really quite uh, quite su substantial, and access to the the uh, remote sensing and GIS systems is also uh, getting much better. So the use of these tools is getting is becoming easier in ac across uh, m many countries. Um, I certainly think occasionally they may need a little bit of support and help. But it's more the way in which one combines these tools and the role of natural capital here, I think, is helpful in, in providing a, a coalescing um, idea which in which the, the tools can be used. 
we certainly be happy. We're working with GGKP, not only in India, but we've provided some support in, in um, Rwanda, in Kyrgyz, and a number of other countries that are keen to use this, this method. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, a related question, perhaps I could, uh, if Kum is there, perhaps she might like to answer this as well. Um, are there good examples of um, uh, successful applications, uh, partly in developing countries, but also for that matter in developed countries? Are there case studies where we can, um, uh, which we can use as examples of how this works, how this agenda is powerful and which would encourage um, uh, wider use, uh, wider use of these tools. Maybe Kumi can. Is Kumi there? I don't know. Is she? Well, if she isn't I, I going can, to. I, <laughs> Hello. I, I yes. can just uh, start by saying that. Um, the realm of possibilities in terms of policy application, um, we are, you know, just scratching the surface. That's how I like to put it, because, you know, when you generate um, a set of accounts um, that yield the possibility of development of numerous indicators um, and also the possibility of what we call post-accounty analytical work that relies on that data, to inform a range of, of, of possibilities. We did work in Peru um, in San Martin in a subnational uh, case study. And in there, for example, um, the accounts um, were very helpful in informing um, development of the forest inventory, you know, the types of data that are further needed uh, and that need to be collected based on the gaps that we identified. But we did a series of exercises with the regional, and, uh, uh, the regional government that explored the use of this spatially explicit data towards prioritization, you know, areas that are important not only for biodiversity, but also for the provision of benefits for other economic sectors. Um, based on a multi-criteria type of analysis where stakeholders determine what the priority, priorities are. I mean, this is just a, 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 an initial set of examples that come to mind that the data, the tables, the spatially explicit um, information in terms of the maps allow for the combination of information that can inform an incredible number of policies um, you know, ranging from the climate policies that I mentioned before, but from the uh, environmental impact assessment for the um, siting of, of large investment or infrastructure. Well, I might just add a couple of words. Uh, basically, uh, as Mary mentioned earlier, the SEEA uh, uh, experimental accounts, and I'm involved in uh, providing some guidelines on that. And it's quite, uh, there's been some really quite impressive work on natural capital um, uh, accounts uh, being prepared in South Africa, in, the, in one part of South Africa, in KwaZulu Natal, in, um, in China, in, in, for China in, in India, and, and uh, in Mexico. And these are the way in which these are coming together. You can really see that the the, the build up from the uh, the, the data from uh, uh, the, the at a much at a granular level is going to be able to provide inputs into decision making where uh, the, the estimates of uh, natural capital will will i think have quite a significant role to play well that's very interesting and perhaps i could follow those up with one question which struck me as really quite interesting uh, it came, I think, originally out of Rosa Mary's um, presentation, but it's actually relevant to what you've also just said, Neil. Um, uh, should we be satisfied with the extent to which countries, developed countries, as well as developing countries, have actually implemented natural capital accounting? After all, the SEEA has been around for an awfully long time now. Uh, do we need to do more to, in to encourage its, its use, or uh, uh, do we feel actually that things are progressing okay? 
Well, I think we ought to do more, but you know, Joe, well, the, the UK is, is what is has been leading on this and been doing rather um, rather a good job of producing some uh, uh, accounts uh, which uh, have been uh, helpful to the countries I've just mentioned. The Netherlands uh, is is also in in that in that group, but uh, at, at that level of detail, there are few countries that have managed it so far. So I yes, I think we do need to 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 get get more countries on board to 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 produce those kinds of those kinds of wealth accounts, natural wealth accounts. I agree, um, but I think there is tremendous momentum. I see that you know the revision of the guidelines, which are um, currently doing for the ecosystem accounts, and the develop you know the accepting it as international standard. I think will be, as I said before, a major step forward that I'm sure we will increase adoption uh, of, of, many, of many countries. But right now, I spoke on ecosystem accounting um, specifically, but you know, we need to think about that, that there is a central framework as well, and there is great degree of adoption on the central framework. Uh, and the UN that leads this process, the UNSD, uh, really sees tremendous progress in the last three years since we last did a global estimate of the adoption. So I think it's increasingly getting adopted um, and, and, you know, as I said before, under various um, degrees uh, in terms of the scope of the scale. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me raise another, let me raise another, or let put another question that's been raised, and that is, uh, technology is pretty important in this area. It certainly has been in the UK in case of um, the falling cost of um, uh, wind production, for example, of energy. Uh, are we paying enough attention to pushing the technologies in the right direction? And even if we're not paying enough attention to that, are we actually exploiting uh, ecologically favourable technological advances to the extent that we should? Well, I spoke on Earth observation uh, and, you know, the, the work that we are doing with NASA, which is, um, speaks to the, the power of technology, the ability of computing large data sets um, with uh, cloud computing. Um, this is an example of where, you know, technology is there for us. And, um, you know, my interactions with the space agencies and whether it's NASA or in the European Space Agency, there's a great degree of interest from those agencies to make the data available, to make the data useful for um, accounting or you know, any and sort of um, um, policy-driven uses. So I think you know, in that sense, um, it, there, is, there is a great degree of progress. There is also some good work, um, and Anub is certainly more familiar with that, with artificial intelligence that would allow us to um, do more of these uh, measurements of ecosystem services. The Basque Center is certainly um, and one of the leaders in that, that space. So yes, I think that we are utilizing um, technology, um, and, but obviously, you know, there's there's more that can be used, and I think you know, um, with time, we will we'll certainly um, become more familiar with some of the op other possibilities. I think, Joe, you were you had in mind not so just the technologies for the, for the ecosystem measurement, but also the technologies in in clean energy. Was your example, and were we doing what, what, what was enough being done? Well. I think almost certainly more could be done, more should be done to to make the transition in 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 those areas. But the question really is, can we help that by uh, in the the way in which we we talk and use the 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 tools of natural capital and and the and the measurement of ecosystem benefits? And I think as we develop these 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 tools, it 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 should help to. To, to give 
greater impetus to the to the values which are underrepresented when we make the policy decisions. And and in, and more and more we find that as we as the information base improves, the case for the transition becomes stronger. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're getting towards the end of our time, uh, but just before we close, uh, as a bit of a hospital pass, could I ask you both if you'd like to say what what would be the one thing you would most like to see happen as a way of showing or of uh, making this agenda uh, advance? Uh, Rosemary, ladies first. <laughs> Uh, I would, my dream would be for more countries to embrace uh, the system of environmental economic accounting. I've been working in the field of ecosystems for many, many years now, and I see this as the most promising uh, approach that have, I've ever, ever seen because it's systematic, it's repeated, it's consistent, um, compatible with the system of national accounts. And so to me, it moves us from this uh, one-off assessments that we used to do and still do, and there are in some cases important for a specific policy applications, but to something that it's much bigger that treats the environment um, with, you know, the respect and, and the need of, you know, understanding um, of its contribution to economy. So my dream was um, for countries to embrace uh, ecosystem accounting. Um, following the system of the environmental economic accounting, global adoption. I think I can agree with that. Uh, I'd like to see more use of the idea of natural capital based on the kinds of uh, very in, in, impressive work that has been done in recent years to try and document, measure, track uh, the different components of natural capital and natural wealth. and. Uh, the, the the details there the the the, the, the are, are really very helpful and countries that have been leading it if only they could get more to countries to adopt it i think that would make a big difference okay well thank you very much um there's a lot more questions that come in which i don't think we're going to be able to do justice uh to this afternoon but i think that's a mark itself of um how much energy and attention there is around the world being given to this agenda, and that's really very gratifying. Uh, from the point of view of the, um, the GGKP expert group, uh, we've been uh, really uh, very privileged, I think, to be able to play a small part in uh, pushing forward this agenda, but we'll go on doing so. Uh, most importantly, to reiterate what I said a, a little while ago, uh, to the extent that people uh, want to make common cause, to work with us, to share results, uh, collaborate, uh, that's what we do. That's what we'd love to hear from you about and um, uh, work forward uh, over the next few years as this agenda gets taken forward. Otherwise, I think it's been a really fascinating afternoon, certainly from my point of view. Uh, what I think I'd like to do is just to thank uh, very quickly uh, well, first of all, obviously, the panellists and indeed the earlier presenters, Paul, uh, uh, Rosemary, uh, Anil, uh, Kumi, Anthony, and John for um, uh, starting us off in all this, John Morn. Uh, also to thank uh, GGKP for um, making the event possible. Uh, and it's running in a very smooth way, I thought. So thanks not only to John Morn, but also to um, uh, Jessica Burns and to um, Sue Liu uh, and their teams who've actually made the event possible this afternoon with an enormous number of participants, I may say. And then finally, thanks to everyone who's um, uh, uh, taken part and um, submitted questions and um, those questions themselves have generated sub-debates, I see, and that's also very healthy, so we're very pleased to see that. So thank you to everyone for taking the time this afternoon. And maybe that's the point at which we should say, regretfully, goodbye. So have a safe, have a nice rest of the day and enjoy yourselves. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.